And uh, it's going to start at verse 9. And uh, it'll go to verse 13. And if you wouldn't mind doing it, I'd like you to read vocally and out loud with me while I read these verses. Are you ready? Verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you clap your hands and thank the Lord together? <clears throat> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I, uh, I, I guess I enjoy uh, sometimes terrifying people. And uh, I, I never did enjoy just the normal stuff. I, I wanted people to think. I wanted them to kind of slow their mind down to a thinker's pace and uh, uh, kind of pitch your mental tent for a while. And, and just, uh, I, I, I used, I, I've worn out a couple Bibles, and uh, uh, it was very common. I used to think that really spiritual people colored in their Bibles. You know, they wrote things and... and uh, I remember the day I got the Holy Ghost. The next day uh, after I got the Holy Ghost, I took my father's Bible, and I went one page at a time through that entire Bible, and everything my dad had written in his Bible, I wrote in mine. And it meant nothing to me, but my dad was a, what I considered a spiritual person, and so his Bible was written in, and I wanted to be a spiritual person, you know? Spiritual people were... When they dropped their Bible, it was like a grenade, and it, it took about 10 minutes to pick it up, you know, and spiritual people had, had church bulletins and dried flowers and newspaper clippings and different things stuck in their Bible, you know, and, uh, and I would underscore things, and when I felt like I saw something in, in the Word of the Lord, I would, I would underline it, and, uh, but as, as I've gone on, uh, I don't write in my Bible as much as I used to because I found that when I underlined something, when I would read that verse uh, the next time, I would immediately go to what I had underscored and in my own pompous way say, well, I I've pretty much got that one figured out and uh, go on to the stuff that I hadn't written in. And, uh, um, but the Bible is a living thing. Jesus said that. My word is spirit and it's life. And I've read a lot of different books, as you have, I'm sure. But uh, none of them do for me what the Bible does. I've never, ever read another book that can make me want to pray. I've never, ever read another book that will bring me under conviction. I've, uh, I've read some sentimental old stories, you know, that make me kind of get teary-eyed and stuff about some hunting dog that died or some tragedy or whatever. But... Uh, uh, but 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 to pray in repentance uh, that that this this Bible uh, has the ability to uh, reach your spirit and not just your mind. And so I will attempt to do something here tonight. I I, I don't want to do a travesty of the word of the Lord. Uh, but through the years, uh, I I just I I think there are just an awful lot of things that we quote, quote wrongly. I, I, uh, for instance, one of the first things that ever happened to me when I was a young preacher, people said, you need to be instant in season and out of season. But when I really read it, it doesn't say and. It says you need to be instant in season, out of season. So there was no out of season to us. It wasn't instant in season and out of season. It's just when everything else was out of season, you're supposed to be in season. It's kind of like an evergreen, you know. Other trees leave their, lose their leaves, but we're not supposed to. Uh, there's a place in the scripture people have misquoted for years. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Uh, that prepositional phrase isn't there. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Which means that you can't limit the blood to just sins. 
The blood that came from his side was to deal with our sin. But what about the blood from his back? That wasn't for your sin. That was by his stripes you would be healed. What about that curse that he turned into a crown and put it on top of his head? That was bomb for your brain. That would help your thought life. Because you are spirit, mental, and physical. And you cannot limit the blood of Jesus to simply the spiritual aspect. There are no limits on the atonement. The blood can touch your body. The blood can touch your mind. The blood can touch your spirit. And there are words and phrases and things that we traffic in very, very often. And I, 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 I don't think we really, 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 really look at them. Tonight, we'll deal with a subject about the kingdom. And, uh, uh, you know, people say, well, we're in the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I found some scriptures that are very, very interesting to me. It says in the book of Mark, chapter number 4 and verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Watch and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I think we live under a delusion that basically says, when I am born again of the water and spirit, I am baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit, speak with tongues, I am immediately in the kingdom. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And one of the ways you can prove that is in John chapter 3. There's a man by the name of Nicodemus who is at the very least a lawyer and at most a, a possible judge. He is coming to Jesus by night. This is the very same man that will be out of the closet in just a little while. And he will beg publicly for the body of Jesus. But right now he is coming by night. And he says in John chapter 3, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. How do we know that? For no man could do the miracles which you do, except God be with him. The Bible says in the book of Acts, there's more in the book of Acts chapter 2 than just verse 38. There really is. And uh, that might come as quite a revelation to you, but it does say in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. How? By miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. That's how Jesus was approved. By miracles, signs, and wonders. It says in the book of John 3, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do the miracles which thou doest except God would be with him. Watch what Jesus says. You must be born again of water and spirit. And he said, if you are not born again of water and spirit, you'll never see the kingdom. And then Jesus says, don't be amazed. How can I get into my mother's womb the second time after I've been born? He said, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Except the man is born again of water and spirit. He said, uh, you're never going to enter the kingdom. So there are five things that Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3. Number one, you must be born again. Number two, he qualifies how you are born again by being water baptized and spirit filled. The third thing that Jesus said would happen is this. 
after you are water baptized and spirit filled, you're going to see the kingdom. The fourth thing that Jesus taught is now you're going to have to make up your mind whether or not you are going to enter what you see. The fifth thing he taught was the wind blows wherever it wants to. You don't know where it came from. You have no idea where it's going. You just only know why it's there or when it's there. I, I in Acts chapter 1, it said there was about 120, and you can have names for 16 of them. You have the 16 disciples. You have their names. You have the mother of Jesus who is there. That would give you 12 it says his brethren are there. That's James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas that are given to us in Matthew 13, 54, and 55. It says his sisters are there, but we never do know what the names of the sisters of Jesus were. But we do know the names of his four half-brothers. There's about 120, and I can give you names, I'm confident, for at least 16 of that about 120. So there's about 100 or 104 that I don't have names for. I always have believed one of those nameless 104 was Nicodemus. And one of the reasons I believe that is because when you compare John 3 and Acts 2, it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I think that's what Jesus was telling the old boy back there. You're going to know when it happens because you're going to see and you're going to sense the wind. And when you sense the wind, you'll know this is what I'm talking about, Nicodemus. This is the account and event of people being born again. But it is important to me to point out the fact that just because you are born again does not mean you are in the kingdom. The kingdom is something that is presented to you after you are born again. You'll see it. Now you're going to have to make up your mind. Are you willing to enter the kingdom way of life? Because you will find in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark, nobody's baptized in Jesus' name. Nobody is filled with the Holy Ghost yet. And yet Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's not preaching about water baptism and the infilling of the spirit. That's not the kingdom message. That's how you get born again and are presented with the kingdom. But the concept of the kingdom is a totally different situation than being born again. Lots of people that get born again never enter the kingdom. When he comes back, it says people are going to be with him and they will be called chosen and faithful. In the United States, they call people into the military. You used to have what the, where they would uh, call people up and have the draft. We don't have that anymore, but when they would have that, they would call you. A lot of people were called, but you had to pass a physical. You had to go through some mental tests and some, some basic math skills. If you couldn't pass the test, it didn't matter if you were called. You were never chosen. And if you were chosen to go into the military, that didn't guarantee that you were going to come out of the military with what was called an honorable discharge. You could be called. You could be chosen. You could go into the military, and you could be dishonorably discharged. So it's three separate situations of being called, being chosen, and then being faithful after the choice has been made. Because according to the Bible, what is our first priority? Seek ye first the kingdom. And all these other things shall be added unto you. I can prove to you again and again because you see there are not just nine beatitudes. There are at least, there are at least ten. <laughs> there are at least ten. It says John the Baptist, he anoints the Lord. This is 
the lamb that takes away the sin of the whole world. And that's great when you're loose on the street and you've got lots of followers. But six months later, he's in jail. And his following has dwindled down to just a few faithful disciples. Somehow he gets a message out of his cell to these disciples. They go to a place where Jesus is ministering. And at the end of the lesson, he kind of opens it up for question. And at the back of the crowd, someone says, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Jesus said this, Go and tell John again. No one said John wanted us to ask you this question. But Jesus knew where the question originated from. Go and tell John again. He said the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And they have the gospel preached unto them. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. In another translation it says, Blessed is the man who doesn't get angry or upset by the way I conduct my business. Jesus is telling John, you made the right choice. I am the lamb. Don't second guess yourself now, son. I know you're in prison. I know you're alone. But under that anointing weeks ago, you made the right choice. I am the Messiah. But understand this, John. Don't be offended at what I'm doing. I am preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? Not simply water baptism and the infilling of the spirit. It's much, much more than that. I have asked people for years, what is the gospel? Don't tell me it's the good news. What is, according to the Bible, the gospel? It is very common to hear this response. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it does say that in 1 Corinthians 15. And I believed that for a long time, but I no longer believe that. I don't believe the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I believe this. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, like 1 through 4, it says, uh, Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day and that he was seen. He was seen of above 500 brethren. He was seen of me like one born out of due season. He was seen by the apostles. What is the gospel? The gospel Pentecost is not just water baptism and the name of the Lord and the infilling of the Spirit. The real gospel is the water baptism in the name, the infilling of the Spirit, and then people would see Jesus in you and I. And if people don't see Jesus in you and I, we're only preaching half the Bible, half the gospel. The gospel is not just water baptism and the infilling of the spirit. There needs to be miracles. There needs to be signs. There needs to be wonders. That's just as much the kingdom as this other message. Because you get what you preach. The reason we have modest people in this room tonight is that's what we preach. The reason people return their tithing is because that's what we preach. The reason people are baptized in the name of the Lord and filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what we preach. The reason you worship so magnificently with your mouth and your hands and your music is that is what we preach and teach. But there is a part of this gospel and this Bible that is just as much scripture as all of the previous things I have just mentioned. It is biblical that Jesus would be seen in a miraculous way by your neighbors, by the people that you work with, by the people that come into this church house. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Seek that first. 
I'm not minimizing water baptism in Jesus' name or the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's paramount. But that is the new birth message. That's not the grown-up message. One man in Hebrew said, not laying again the foundations of repentance and of baptisms and of resurrection from the dead. Let's forget those things which are behind and let's go on to perfection. He doesn't mean forget baptisms. Don't think repentance doesn't matter. He's saying get those things established in your life and let's go on to something more. God has more for you than simply being water baptized in his name and filled with his spirit. God wants to use you to affect somebody else in this city so that they would see Jesus in you. In the book of Matthew, this, this one of the most traumatized scriptures in the Bible is Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And I've preached it, and I've heard it preached. And if you want something, you got to get violent. Has no idea, not even close to what that verse means. Not even, I preached it with great conviction, but it's not right. This is what it says The kingdom of heaven is suffering because selfish men are using the gospel of kingdom for their own advancement. That's what it means. What is the gospel of the kingdom? Not the salvation message. What's the gospel once you get in that kingdom? Not the gospel to get in. What's the gospel after you get in? Because it's saying, does this sound familiar? That the kingdom is suffering because people are using the gospel's message, the kingdom's message, to line their own pockets with money. How many people use healing? and the miraculous for their own advancement. Jesus, or Peter rather, one time looked at a man and he said, your money's going to perish with you. He said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Because in the book of Corinthians, I want to know, how can you distinguish the kingdom? This is what it says in Corinthians 4. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. I have dedicated my life to perfecting the art of preaching. Some say I'm very good at it. But I have dedicated a lot of my life to something that doesn't really matter. Because the kingdom has nothing to do with just how good you can speak with your words. The kingdom of God's not in words. It's in power. Seek that. Seek that. There's a great scripture in the book of Acts 16. Paul goes to Mars Hill, Areopagus. He's been trained at the field of of Gamaliel. In my mind, it's his day to shine. All right, you dumb Pentecostals, you just stay back here. These are my kind of people. These are educated people. And when you get to Acts 17, I'm convinced Paul dipped his tongue in a rainbow. And he's quoting philosophy. And he's talking about Stoics and Epicureans. And he's giving this all fancy stuff. And I'm absolutely convinced that Paul was convinced himself he's going to wow them. It's his chance to use his education. And when he gets done with what I'm sure was a magnificent message, you know what they said to him? We'll hear you again on a later date concerning this matter. Translation, get out of the way, preacher. Somebody else wants to talk. That's Acts 17. Next verse, Acts 18 and 1. And Paul came to Corinth. And I know what he did because it's found in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. 
He said, for my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Why? I just tried that at the last place. It didn't work. This time, we're going to believe God in the demonstration of his spirit and the power of his resurrection. I tried that fancy preaching at the last place, impressed of a lot of people, but nobody, it, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a revival. We need more than fancy preaching. You have a beautiful building, wonderful music, great staff, magnificent city. But in the midst of all of that, I'm asking you this year, separate yourself and seek the kingdom. Seek the kingdom. God, lay bare your arm. Show us your power. Show up and show off. Show the city of Sydney that you are the one true God. His name is not Allah. His name is not Buddha. He is not just higher knowledge. His name is Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. name. You're going to find you're going to get thought if you believe this because in Matthew 23 and verse 13 Jesus said woe unto you scribes Pharisees and hypocrites for you shut up the kingdom against men you neither go in yourselves and neither suffer you to let them go in you don't believe the miraculous and you won't let anybody else believe the miraculous but in spite of those impediments and those walls and that opposition I'm asking you to believe God for it because it's just just as much of a Bible message as Acts 2 and verse 38. Because in Matthew chapter C, the Bible says in Psalms 19, the heavens, plural, heavens, declare the glory of God. It says in Corinthians 12, I was caught up to the third heaven. Reason dictates if there's a third heaven, there's a second heaven, and there's a first heaven. And if there was just one heaven, and it was around the throne of the Lord, I could understand that. But the Bible said there are heavens. There's more than one it says in the book of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Notice what it says next. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. He wasn't talking about water baptism. He wasn't talking about Holy Ghost in Philly. He was talking about binding and loosing something in a heavenly realm. And if the only heaven is the one around the throne, why do you need to tie anything up there or let anything go? It's obvious there's another realm. There's another world that lives between where I am and where the throne of the Lord is. And there is a fight and a battle and you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but you are going to wrestle against principality, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. And if you're going to wrestle in that realm, you're going to have to understand, I need the power of God on my life. Jesus gave parables about the kingdom. He said the kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed. What's that mean? It's minimized by many. But what is minimized by many is a great thing. Another parable is it's like living, just a little bit of it, but it can affect the whole thing. It's again, it's small to many, but it's very powerful to me. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's in a field. He said, whatever you do, sell everything you have and go buy that treasure. Whatever you do, get that treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And he found the pearl of great price. He's saying, this is what my kingdom is like. He said, everything you've got pales in comparison to how valuable that one 
pearl is. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. You're going to throw it into the sea. You're going to get good fish and bad fish, which means sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. But that won't stop you from throwing your net. I've heard people say, I don't believe in that prophecy. I heard a lousy prophecy once that never came to pass, and I gave up on prophecy. Hey, folks, I've heard lots of bad preaching in my life, and I haven't given up on preaching just because I heard one bad message, and I'm not giving up on prophecy just because I've heard one bad one. I'm convinced there's another realm. There's another world. God wants us to operate in the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which had a marriage for his son. And there's people that made light of it. But he replaced them and he got somebody else. Surely, you just don't believe in a Bible, Jesus. Surely, you don't just believe in a Bible, Jesus, do you? People say, oh, yeah, I believe in the Bible, Jesus. Let let me try to explain it to you in another way. (laughs) There was a guy named Bill Shakespeare one time. And uh, he wrote uh, a magnificent book called Romeo and Juliet. But he wasn't over when he did that. He wrote another one called Macbeth. When he done with that one, he wrote another one, you know. King Lear, on and on and on, the five great tragedies. You ever heard of The Snows of Kilimanjaro, written by old Ernie Hemingway? But what about that one for whom the bell tolls? See, old Ernest Hemingway had more in him than just one good book. And Bill Shakespeare had in him more than just one good play. Do I believe that Jesus can do everything that's in this book? Absolutely. But don't you limit Jesus to the Bible. He wrote the Bible. He's bigger than the Bible. If you think this is the only book he can write, you just saying he's got one good bestseller in him and that's it. Not a chance. The Bible said there were many other things which Jesus did. If they would have written them all down, not even the world could contain the books that should be written. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 and verse 20, unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above All that we ask or even think, but it is according to the power that works in us. It appears that you and I set the high watermark with our thoughts and our words. And whatever we think about him and talk about him, he will exceed that. In other words, if you think little thoughts, he'll be a little bit better than little. But if you're willing to think and say great things, he'll do exceedingly abundant above whatever you say about him. Whatever you think about him. See, I used to learn to play golf I, I, never, I was raised in a church where you went to hell if you played golf. So I never did. And I get married to Renee. And her dad wakes me up one morning, says, if you're going to be my son-in-law, you're going to play golf. <laughs> so he gave me a bag of shag balls and an old broken three wood and took me out to the golf course. I was absolutely convinced I'd be struck dead. But I wasn't. And I got addicted to this crazy little ball that Winston Churchill said was an odd game with implements ill-devised for the task of getting the orb in the hole. And uh, if you've ever played golf, everybody knows what your first goal is. You want to break 100. And then you want to shoot 90 golf. 
because most golf courses have 18 holes, four par fives, four par threes, and the rest par fours. And if you bogey every hole on the golf course, which is one over par, you can shoot 90. And if you can shoot 90 golf, you can play with 98% of the golfers in the world. And I made up my mind I was going to beat my father-in-law. <laughs> and it took a lot of work. But I remember the day when I finally beat him. It was a great day. <laughs> Tiger Woods has put golf on the map around the world. Everybody thinks their little Bubba Lou is going to be the next Tiger Woods. At the risk of exploding your bubble, let me explain something to you. Last year in America alone, they sold six million sets of golf clubs. There are 125 men in the world who are good enough to play the PGA Tour. 125 and that's it they are freaks of nature <laughs> their hand-eye coordination is off the charts and in the midst of this magnificent game that men dedicate their lives to comes this little Thai black boy on the scene and he just massacres him. Tiger Woods in the golfing world is the hundred year story he only shows up once in a great while. But when he does, he blows down anything that's in his path. But Tiger Woods, as great as he is, has never shot a 59 in competitive golfing rounds. There are only three men in the history of organized golf that have ever shot a 59. Al Guyberger, David Duvall, and a guy named Chip Beck. Three men have shot 59. A great golfer by the name of Ben Hogan said, in theory, it's possible to birdie every hole. And if you could birdie every hole in 18 holes, you would shoot a 54. There have been three men that have shot a 59. Nobody's ever shot a 58. But when you're dealing with Jesus, you see, if you'll just believe that he's Tiger Woods. Jesus can shoot a 54 every round. I've played good golf one day and there's something after 20 years of playing golf I've never been able to do. I've never been able to play good golf two days in a row. But if you're going to be a pro, you got to shoot in the 60s four days in a row. You shoot par and you'll starve to death on the PGA Tour. You just got to understand. You got to, what they do say, I'm going to go low. I'm going to go low. I'm going to shoot a lot of birdies. And those guys go out there and they just are convinced. I get up on a tee and I'm just glad to shoot par. But not those guys. They think different than I do. I'm going to birdie this thing. I'm going to ego this hole. It's the way they think. They've devoted their lives to it. And guess what? They do it again and again and again and again. One man in the history of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, has scored 100 points in a basketball game. His name is Wilt Chamberlain. I don't know anything about cricket. I know very little about your footy, so I can't relate to you with some of your sports heroes. But I understand this very, very well. That years ago, there was a British boy by the name of Roger Bannister. And he believed that you could run a mile in under four minutes. The physiologist said that your lungs would explode and nobody could run a mile in under four minutes. But Roger Bannister believed that he could exceed the best that anybody had ever done. And at the risk of his lungs exploding, Roger Bannister broke the barrier. And now the mile is routinely broken at 357, 358, because that man believed. A hillbilly boy from West Virginia named Chuck Yeager believed that he could fly fast. 
faster than the speed of sound. And he did it with gum on his microphone and chattering in his own hillbilly tongue. But he did it because he believed that he could do it. There are barriers in the spirit. There are laws in nature and there are laws in the spirit. And you have to understand that there are barriers that people will impose upon you and barriers that you will impose upon yourself. But listen to me. You got to understand that Jesus can score 110 points anytime he starts dribbling the ball. Jesus can shoot a 54 anytime he tees it up. Jesus can run a mile in three minutes flat. Jesus can do more than anybody else could ever imagine. If we're not saying it, then it's obvious for one reason. We don't even think it. Because thought is the womb of your words. And what bothers me is a lot of people just don't even think it. They don't even think it can happen. Not to me. You understand that you could have the best church in the world and still not live for Jesus. You're going to hear people criticize this church. You ought to do this better. If you just did that, I'd come. If you just do this, I'd come. to Listen to me very closely. Adam and Eve backslid in the garden. Korah backslid following Moses. The meekest man in the Bible. Gehazi backslid following Elisha, the double portioned prophet in the Old Testament. Judas backslid following Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira backslid in the first church in Jerusalem. Demas backslid following Paul. And the devil backslid in heaven. And you can have the best church in the world. And that doesn't guarantee you'll serve the Lord. Joseph, who spent his entire career as a second man, who ended up in prison on a trumped up rape charge, told his brothers, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it to me for good. Moses was an adopted boy. And as an adopted boy, he should have had a chip on his shoulder. And all he had to do was shut up because he knew the balance in the royal checkbook in Egypt. But when he came to years, he refused to be called an Egyptian. What are you talking about, Brother Hoffman? I'm talking about a little girl who doesn't have a name in the Bible. She's a prisoner of war to a Syrian general by the name of Naaman. And that nameless little POW who should have felt so sorry for herself looked at her Syrian captor and said, there's a man in my country that if you'd go to his house and listen to what he has to say, I promise you God would heal you of your leprosy. She should have shut up. She had a perfectly good reason to shut up. Not even mention or glorify the prophet or her God. But in the midst of captivity... She can't be silenced. She's still going to be a witness. Job lost his family, his health, his possessions. Job, what's the worst thing God could ever do to you? I think if he killed me and never ever explained why. But though he slays me, I'm still going to trust him. I can give you example after example of people who had great circumstances and yet their lives ended in tragedy. And I can give you people who had horrible tra- circumstances and their lives ended with great testimonies because you'll never have a testimony without a test. Jesus I am convinced was not talking to demons in Matthew 8 when he said, what's your name? I think he was talking to the man. But before the man can respond, the demons say, our name is Legion. How many times do we let our circumstances do our talking? 
What are you identified by here tonight? Aren't you being tired of being known as the deadbeat, the divorcee, the depressed, the despondent one? That's not who you are. What's your name? I found a great scripture years ago in Samuel 22. Jesus is in a cave at Adullam. He's running for his life from Saul. And the Bible said 400 nameless men come to him in the cave. And they ask him to be their captain. I really shouldn't call them nameless because they are named. (laughs) Their first name is distress. Their middle name is debt. And their last name is discontented. It says all 400 of them were in distress. All 400 of them were in debt. Does that sound familiar, Brother Richard? When people come to church in debt, distressed, discontented, nameless. But when you get into 2 Samuel 23, there is the list of David's mighty men. 37 men in all whose names are written for the ages in this Bible. The very same men that just chapters before are in debt and discontented. They're losers. But they align themselves with David. And guess what? You'll read about a guy named Eleazar who had to pry his fingers from his sword after he killed 800 Philistines. You will read of a guy named Adino who killed hundreds with a spear. You'll read about a guy named Shama who defended a pea patch and said, this is as far as it goes. Why would you defend a pea patch, Shama? It's worthless because sooner or later you're just going to have to decide, this is as far as I'm going to let you go. You're not getting anything else of my family. You're not getting any other part of my life. This may mean nothing to you, but it's all I've got left, and I'm going to defend it. You will read about a guy by the name of Benaniah, and if, if I could tell you anything, I would preach to you about courage with cold feet. Because Benaiah went into a pit when there was snow on the ground, knowing there were lions in the pit. His feet were cold, but the guy had courage, and God used him mightily. Men who used to be losers, meaning loners, lunatics, are now called by their name. The Lord knows your name. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob. How many times in this church do we say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And we put so much emphasis on us knowing his name. Do you think he puts any less emphasis on knowing your name? He knows you. And you are not to be identified with your past mistakes and errors any longer. Jesus is calling you tonight to the kingdom way of life. Something greater, something more magnificent. But I have a man in my church that is a, He's a hunting fanatic. And he gave me a magazine by the Matthews Bow Company in Wisconsin. And I'm laying in my bed at night and I pick up that little thing. My wife's asleep. And I open up that brochure. And there it is. The Matthews new bow. The switchback. It's got 80% let off. It'll shoot 310 feet per second. It's quieter than any bow ever built in the history of mankind. It cost a thousand dollars. And I realize I've just bought a bow two years before. 
I don't need another bow. But night after night while my wife's asleep, I'm just thinking about it, you see. But the more and more I watch and the more and more I think about it, when I get home Sunday, I will sneak a new box into the back of my truck that has a Matthew switchback bow in it. I didn't need it. I just kept thinking about it again and again and again and thoughts became actions. And if you'll pick up this brochure and you say, I really don't think I need that. But the more you read about that and the more you see that, you're going to go, boy, I'd like to have one of them. And my good pal, Brother Richard, be reading it here. See, you get weary in this preaching business. You get tired doing it, folks. You just do. You say, yeah. You got to wear a lot of hats when you're responsible for a congregation. And all of a sudden you're reading through this book and all of a sudden you, it's a great church, see? Nice people here. Lots of established folks. But you're reading this Bible about this new thing called revival. We had one of them a couple years ago in Sydney. I don't really think I need to pay the price for that. But the more and more you read about that, and the more and more you keep thinking about that, I promise you, friend, <laughs> you think about it long enough and you're going to want one real bad. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you are thinking and what you are asking. I'm just here tonight to challenge you to start at the very minimum. Would you at least start thinking that it could happen? Because if you'll just start thinking about it, it won't be much longer before you'll start talking about it. And whatever you ask and whatever you think, he'll do more. Would you stand? See, if you just want to be a bogey golfer, fine. Jesus will shoot a couple pars. But if you want to be a great church, you got to understand that there's a God that is appealing to you right now. I believe he can do everything that's in this book. But I refuse to believe that everything that he can do is in this book. He's bigger than this book. I pastor a lady named Dolores Hill. She's been my secretary for 19 years. She had two children, Stacy and Todd. Stacy is the one girl that every pastor would love to have in their church. Stacy Hill is the most perfect girl that I ever will be permitted to pastor in my life. She was magnificent. She was student body president. She was National Honor Society president. She was the senior class president. She was the homecoming queen. Now in my little church, she never went to the prom because they danced there, you know, and you can't dance. And she came to me and she said, Pastor, I've been elected to be the homecoming queen. And if you say I shouldn't go, I won't go. And I said, oh, no, you're going. I'm going to go to the prom. Yeah, you're going. We're going to buy you the most beautiful, elegant, modest dress anywhere we can find. And they found her a beauty, man. Youth director took her to the prom. Captain on the basketball team comes up and says, would you like to dance? And she says, let me pour you some punch. <laughs> Open up the prom and she cuts the ribbon and she goes over by the punch table he comes back again would you like to dance now let me pour you some more punch and he laughed and he said you don't dance do you Pentecostal girl no she said I, I do dance but it's usually in church 
And he said, do you think I, I, we could go out? And she said, oh, sure. But I'm only permitted to go out after church with our youth group, and you have to meet my pastor. <laughs> and he said, okay. And he came to church, and he introduced himself to me. Wonderful kid. Daddy was wealthy. He's got a full scholarship for basketball to college. He's the big deal in Warren Consolidated Schools. And he likes this Pentecostal girl in our church. He comes to church on Sunday. Power of God starts moving. Starts shaking. He doesn't know what to do. Tuesday starts the senior high camp meeting. Without me even knowing it, our young people took him to the camp meeting. It's wild and woolly. Kids that don't even know him are grabbing him and shaking him and speaking in tongues. And the power of God hits David and he falls on the floor. In that old dusty camp building, God miraculously fills him with the Holy Ghost. We bring him back to church, baptize him. He goes to college, full ride scholarship. Thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I didn't say a word to him. He's just out playing basketball and he gets convicted of wearing shorts. And he tells his coach, I, I'd like to wear them long practice pants in a game. And, and the coach says, okay. And they win, of course, because he's a red shirt freshman. He's a magnificent ball player. And, and then the, the leader of the school says, he's got to dress like everybody else. And David Mize looked at his coach and said, well, that's the way it is. Uh, I guess I won't be playing basketball anymore. And his coach said, but David, if you don't play basketball, you don't get any money to come to school. And he said, I understand. And he left. His father became so angry at me. I thought his dad was going to sue me because his dad didn't have a clue what was going on. And I watched Tacy and David. I watched him promote it again and again. He makes a lot of money now. They have three wonderful children. It's a magnificent family. But in that very same family was a boy named Todd. Same parents, same pastor, same church environment. Somehow Todd lost his way. I can't begin to tell you how many thousands of dollars they spent bailing him out of jail. I don't know how many letters I wrote to judges asking for leniency. I don't know how many times Todd would come on the back of the porch of his mom and dad's house and just regurgitate all over the porch. And they'd find him the next day in his own filth and vomit. I would watch my secretary day after day in the office never say a word. But I could tell when she hadn't slept and her eyes were puffy. And I'd hear her prayers in the prayer room. And I would watch them in church. And her husband was never a really spiritual man. He was a good man. But he wasn't a spiritual man. And I challenged him one day. You need to become a worshiper. You need to become a worshiper. And I watched Jack Hill in his 50s get out of his old patterns and start moving across that church. Clapping his hands. Raising his hands, speaking with tongues. All of a sudden, Todd showed up. Then he showed up again. Boom, he's at the altar. Three months later, he wants to marry a girl in our church. <laughs> I marry him to Jamie, this great girl in our church. Before I came here, I was in my truck with Todd and he said, I think maybe you'll be able to tell this story in Australia, Pastor, if it'll help you. He said, I was at the bank the other day. And he said, uh, I met this lady at the bank. And she said, oh, son, we're just so glad you're in the neighborhood. You and that, you and that beautiful blonde-haired girl that you're married to. I can't tell you how, how grateful we are in the neighborhood to have you living there. Do you know, son, that there was a man that used to live in that house where you're living? He looked kind of like you, but he was a drunk and he was a drug addict. And we'd find him laying out in the grass and laying on his porch and they had wild parties. And we're so glad that guy doesn't live there anymore. We're so glad that you moved into that house. And he said, all the while, pastor, I didn't want to tell her. 
I'm the guy that was thrown up on the grass that collapsed on the porch. And I said, Todd, what in the world happened to you? What made you change? He said, I, I just kind of read that story about the prodigal son that was in that pit. And the Bible said he came to himself. And he said, one day, Brother Hoffman, after all my money was gone and I had thrown up again, I just said, you know what? I don't want to live this way anymore. I believe the Lord can change my life. He said, I was always intimidated by my perfect sister and was always ashamed of the grief that I brought to my family. But I had to get beyond my past and my grief and my mistakes. And I had to be convinced that the Lord that I had served when I was a boy still knew me and still loved me. And if you go tonight into Sterling Heights, I promise you Todd Hill will be right there with Jamie worshiping, magnifying God. He's got a great job. I soon they'll have babies. She's finishing college to be a teacher in December. And I've watched God just change all of that. I can tell you story after story after story after story. I'm in this for more than Jesus' name baptism. I am in this for more than seeing people speak with tongues. I am convinced that there is a kingdom way of life. That we have a choice tonight as to whether or not we're going to enter into that. You've got to be convinced there's more to this than Jesus' name, baptism, and speaking with tongues. We need to see a display of the magnificent power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Ooh. Hallelujah. 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 I have been preaching since I was 19 years old. And in the last 30 years, I don't remember being more tired and more nauseous than I ever was when this service started tonight. I was worn out and sick, but made up my mind. I'm going to go preach the word. I'm going to believe God will do the... I can tell you right now that even though my voice is hoarse, I am strong. The nausea is gone. The fatigue is gone. The weariness is gone. Just in the time of my being here, ministered to by your music, ministering the power of the word of the Lord, God has touched my body. If you are here tonight, I'm asking you to come to this altar and believe that God would touch you and change you and rearrange your life. Believe that he can touch your family. Believe that he can touch your marriage. Believe that he can touch your mind. Believe that he can affect your boy, your girl, your husband, your wife, your job, your tomorrows your yesterdays.